Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the May uh, event for the Smart Grid Educational Series webinar. Uh, this 90-minute event occurs uh, every month on the second Monday of every month at 1 p.m. Pacific. And the purpose of this educational webinar is to bring subject matter experts in the various areas of the electric sector and have them share uh, their expertise and in an educational and intellectually stimulating environment with the hope that you will learn from this and be able to use the information that you receive in the various activities that you are all involved in in the industry. Uh, we also like to use this forum to tell people about events and organizations so that people can network and reach out to a wider audience. And uh, with that in mind, if you see the slide that is on the screen right now, uh, this is uh, an event that is occurring on May 24th at Santa Clara University. And Sustainable Silicon Valley is a nonprofit organization uh, that uh, caters to the needs of uh, companies and individuals as well as uh, state and federal organizations. It brings expertise together on what will constitute a sustainable system that brings water, power, electricity, and all aspects of uh, waste and recycling and all of those things. So uh, check them out at uh, www.sustainablesb.org. And this event, as I mentioned, is on May 24th. Uh, you can go to their website to register for this event. So now I would like to move to the next portion of our webinar, which is a presentation by Andres Carvalho on the need for a smart grid network management system. Uh, Andres is with Proximetry. He's going to tell you more about what that company does. And, and he will also share his experiences that he had as CIO of Austin Energy and how, uh, as one of the pioneers in this area, started talking about smart grid when people used to have puzzled faces in response to it saying, what is that? And so it's very nice to hear from what I refer to uh, affectionately as an original gangster in smart grid. So I am now going to invite Andres Carvalho. I'm going to move the presenter ball to him. And uh, I will invite him to come and present his presentation on smart grid uh, network management. And then after this presentation is over, we are going to go into a Q&A, which I will moderate. And I will uh, allow you all to ask questions online. Uh, if you are just audio only, I can move you up uh, to uh, the unmute uh, mode so that you can pose your questions. But it's preferred if you have internet access to post your questions in the Q&A uh, window. So with that, Andres, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Delightful to be here with you today. Um, a great uh, morning, afternoon, or evening. Um, looking forward to sharing some time. Excited about the interaction. You know, uh, a practitioner on these things. Uh, so I'll uh, to um, spend some time though. Um, yeah kind of doing a, a bit of a deep dive. I have a few slides, not many, about 20-some. Uh, but I would like to really um, take some time talking about some of these slides and some of the challenges and some of the things to think about and uh, how to go about uh, best practices and so on. So the first thing that I want to share with you all is you probably know that I energy from 2003 to 2010, and I wrote a book, that, and here's a slide on the book and the detail review some folks about the book. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is in, uh, in detail, 
so if you haven't read I strongly recommend that you look it up. It, you can find it on on and there's a hard copy of it, but there's also a kit. And then at uh, the publisher's website, there's an ebook version of just about any ebook. So maybe a, a bit of uh, grounding rules to to get it all on the same page and and, and give you a, a little bit of a historical reference journey at Austin Energy, how this all got started. Uh, and basically, think about this is that the journey in Austin Energy really provision that we needed to um, come up with in the technology house that basically said that the company had been evolving as the utility uh, from the traditional business and needed to create a new business model and Types of assets, and primarily the company was very focused on energy efficiency. But that evolved into green energy and, and uh, in a centralized fashion. But, but more importantly, also evolved distributed generation and energy storage and the vehicle electri electrification. So the vision when I joined in 2003, and the premise of me joining the company was to cash, uh, both uh, on capital and operating to 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 build this new company, invest in all these new technologies and, and, and master sort of the models of the future before it, they happen and, and hope that they wouldn't be obsolete and, and railroaded by kind of company that would emerge. So, so real, real business behind why to do this. And the, and the goal was to not only make our electric grid that the utility own intelligent um, power plants that we own on nuclear, coal, mass gas, and also added biomass, solar, through the transmission infrastructure, substations, and clearly the part, the part that has never been automated uh, traditionally the distribution and the, all the distribution, electronics, infrastructure, cap banks, feeders, and so on, and then eventually down to formers and then meters. And the vision had far-reaching impact. Beyond that, the company really saw that buildings, both commercial, industrial, and residential, needed to be part grid of the future. So buildings, homes, schools, hospitals, all uh, and then vehicles, right? Uh, so it, it, it's kind of interesting. Back back in 2003, the Austin Energy executive were trying to figure it out. This whole thing work. And my role was to to deliver the technology vision to work. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, in a way, probably one of the coolest world at the time, and and, and throughout my journey there. So back in back in uh, 2004, we, we sort of came with this agreement to use the term smart grid, uh, primarily because you know it was using intelligent IntelliGrid and IBM was pitching into the network, and we wanted to use a term that was free uh, and could be used by everybody. So we kind of picked on that term and started using it uh, quite a bit. And the, our definition again was. The electric grid, utility grid, the building, the home, vehicles, all interconnected. So the question was, how, you know, how, how to go doing that, and we'll get into that in a minute. So, so the the, the other thing about this grid, though, that has this kind of variables beyond the grid attached to it, that mean the infrastructure doesn't belong to you, which requires open standards and communications and methods. Project that has never existed before. So this needed to be designed to be distributed uh, because distributed generation emerged on the edge. Uh, that needed to be interactive because um, the, 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 the sort of the rules and the control the decision making was not just being done by four guys in a room, but now all of a sudden you had to 
pretty much uh, sort of a conductor of an orchestra that included all kinds of the elements that were not part of your infrastructure and your purview. Uh, the question becomes, how do you do that? And clearly that grid needs to be self primarily because you're moving from managing a few thousand devices real time to managing tens of millions, hundreds of millions of things real time, which means that those five guys sitting in the control room can't no longer call on everything that is going on, that they really need to switch and it's managing by exception, and somehow we need to learn how to trust where and networks to make the right decisions. And then last but not least, the DAG to be uh, able to do sort of thing and uh, dynamic load management, load forecasting, so that, you know, ideally when the grid comes in and it gets plugged on the wall that the actual electric grid, the utility is delivering information and electrons from to its service territory, we recognize the device, you know, it's sort of resource, it's sort of load, of that resource and that load and so on. So very just uh, if you think about where we are grid need to go. So another thing to set up our conversation that is very highly important in my opinion is this notion that I keep talking about since back then that this is really a new energy paradigm that is uh, kind of mimicking two other transformations that have occurred which are not you know unique in themselves but they're pretty pretty close to each other and pretty close to what's going on and, and most likely will end the energy industry. Again, this is, you know, a bit of a prediction. But maybe you think about it, you could actually equate mainframes and potential switches, uh, circuit switches, the old-fashioned way in telecom, with the power plants. And then you could also equate many computers to the exit to cogeneration plants. And then the challenge becomes for uh, many of us to really understand what is the equivalent of the PC laptop or the fast phone and the wireless phone or smartphone today. And I would submit to you that those are some form of distributed generation on the thick uh, micro, micro pro computing side and then a mobile thing that, that carries energy. And I would submit to you that the electric vehicle would be the equivalent of smartphones. Now, if you think about that for a moment, and you think about two examples, so I'll give you two, 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 two examples that are really... So, Austin Energy manages uh, greater Austin service area, 1.8 million people today, uh, versus when I joined the company back in 2000. So the company, the, the service in size in less than a decade. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, think, think about the uh, capacity of buildings turn on a distributed generation. So, take solar, for example. So, I a study with the Department of Energy about the solar capacity of Austin, Texas, uh, on, and that number turned out to be And then uh, next to that number, the total vehicle uh, infrastructure in, in Austin, uh, cars, like, which is roughly about a, a million vehicles. Uh, so think for a moment that you have 30% 30, 30 penetration of your vehicles. Um, uh, Andre? Electric, whatever. Yes, sir. Yeah, Andre? Your audio yes, seems sir. to be dipping every four or five words. There. Are you on a voice over IP type phone or a speak? Something is amiss with the audio of your on your side. Okay. Is this better at all? Yes. Yes, it's clear. Much better. Okay. Sorry about that. 
uh, microphones, cables, you name it. Um, so, so basically, what I was alluding to is, let's imagine 30% of the vehicles in Austin uh, switch to electric. That's 300,000 vehicles. And let's say that they have a 10 kilowatt battery in them. So that's 3,000 megawatts. And so 3,000 megawatts of electric V, 2,000 megawatts of solar, and that has 5,000 megawatts total, which is far more than 1,000 megawatts of total production of Austin Energy today. So what should the utility do? And, and you know, should we, we sit there and pretend that it's not going to happen uh, or should something about? Uh, I think there are roughly right now uh, and growing at a, you know, an interest in uh, the total number of electric vehicles in the U.S. Last, or, I'm sorry, 20,000, I think the number was close to 50,000. And the prediction is that that 20, this last year it's going to grow to about 100,000 this year. Boy, those vehicles, those solar rooftops are going to show up in your service. What do you do about it? So what is going on to our uh, conversation here deeply is that uh, it's what I call and electric utilities. Yeah, we're having the audio yes, problem again. Uh, is there a phone that you can pick up and talk to directly and not use the speaker phone, maybe? Okay, hold on. Is this better? Yes. Uh, better? If you continue talking and then see, I, this for some reason your phone connection is weak. It looks okay. like a or IP type phone because it's uh, intermittent. Are you still there, Andres? For the people on the call, we're just trying to get Andres's audio to be a little better because it was a little choppy. Andres, can you hear me? Okay, it looks like he's going to call back in again. Yes, uh, for the people on the call, uh, we are uh, just waiting for Andres Carvalho to call back in again, hoping that there will be a better audio connection. So this is why the presentation right now is on hold until he calls back. So just bear with us for just a minute until he's back on the audio. We're just uh, waiting for Andres to call back in. Hola, hello. Yes, very good. Sorry, guys. This is much is, better. Is this better? Oh, Lord. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry Andres. about that. Murphy's Law. Anyway, so so let me let me try to uh, uh, catch up with time here real quick. Um, so, so basically, you know, you have uh, traditionally dedicated control systems that have been deployed per application type around the industry, uh, and and 
so what happens is, you know, you do a distributed control system at the, at the central power plant, and, and you build a network for that. And then you eventually decide to do a SCADA EMS, and you build a network for that. And then you do something around distribution automation, and then you build another different network for that. And then you do demand response, and maybe you do a third-party deployment, and you use some third-party company with that, and that's another yet another separate network for that. And then you do a smart metering, and then you do another network for that. And, and then you're going to get into the home side of things, and you're going to – piggyback on public carriers, and yet it's another network for that. So so in the end, you know, what happened in Austin Energy is that we ended up managing fiber to the substations and all kinds of different, you know, technologies on wireless, and we had some seven networks total. And, and while you can clearly put this thing together and manage uh, an infrastructure end-to-end -end with seven networks, uh, it was really painful, uh, still is pretty painful to do, uh, troubleshooting, trying to do closed loop control of devices and managing things, it's really difficult. Uh, and if you have outages and storms and things like that, even more complicated because, again, you're dealing with seven different infrastructures, seven different head ends, uh, no real correlation between them, and human beings need to be the ones in between doing the correlating for the networks. Now, it's clearly not a very, you know, uh, sophisticated way of managing, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices. And, and somehow we need to find a, way, a better way. And clearly what's been happening is, you know, as the genie has gotten out of the bottle, and all these networks have emerged that uh, all kinds of new challenges are facing us. So so um, let me move here to the next slide. So one of the things around wireless, and clearly wireless is not the end-all, be-all. There's absolutely fiber, broadband, our power line, power line carrier, uh, Ethernet, and other solutions that are just as good for many of the applications. But but just take the challenge of managing wireless, which is a, you know, I would predict a, a significant bulk of the last mile management of anything that we're going to deploy. And the number of frequencies and issues between license and unlicensed bands and technologies between, you know, say WiMAX or LTE or 3G or Wi-Fi or anything like, you know, RF mesh or things like that. It's just an incredible soup of challenges that, that is very difficult to, to deal with. And wouldn't it be nice if you could somehow have a, uh, you know, a, a single virtual plane of network management where you can still deal with the fact that you need uh, f different physical solutions to these problems, wire or wireless, but you can actually have a closed loop control and manage your edge devices and your infrastructure devices that manage the network themselves all under one single glass, on the, you know, a single view, if you will. Uh, and that's really, that would be sort of, you know, from the service provider point of view, ideal, because then that would make the service provider really focus on service level agreements and things like reliability and uptime and restoration times and all of the above. And, and not have to worry about choosing technologies and have be married to certain vendors and and actually could be focused on deploying best of breed technologies and develop in deploying best of breed best of breed hardware from the best products as they come out in the market and and, and so eventually through interoperability you you could, you know, plug and play, you know, things that traditionally, historically, perhaps were not meant to be mixed to each other or in, or in and playing with each other, but now they could because you have enabled them to do so, at least from the movement of data and the control of the device having a closed loop uh, scenario. So, so, you know, the requirements clearly are changing in, in the utility industry. Uh, from managing a few things, uh, a few thousand things perhaps, you know, your your real-time control needs on an escada system, you know, some of the largest ones in the Western world, 
maybe a million endpoints at most. But most people are really managing a few, a few thousand, maybe a hundred thousand, at most a couple hundred thousand, you know, real-time SCADA points in some of the largest utilities in the world. And, you know, when you compare that to the need of managing, you know, DG and uh, energy storage and electric vehicles and all the infrastructure on the distribution side and on all the meters and perhaps water meters and perhaps gas meters, and all of a sudden you're talking about, you know, millions of things. And, and you know, we have never done this before as an industry, but uh, certainly the telco industry has done it before. The difference is that they have never done it sort of at the – at the clip, if you will, of uh, requirements that we have around uptime, and you know, as an anecdote, and Austin Energy, our network needed to be six six nines of uptime because our electric system had six nines of uptime. So it, it would be silly to run a telco network to manage the grid that had a lesser uptime than the grid that it was managing. Uh, and the question then is, how do you do that, you know, affordably and effectively? And and so we have all kinds of juxtaposing challenges around latency and throughput and availability and scale and price that kind of kind of play against each other. Uh, and, you know, you need uh, in all these requirements not only the pervasiveness of touching everything, but more importantly, really something that I think is really uh, native to the utility talk, uh, in, uh, at least on the electric side, which is assured performance. You know, we – we need to assure delivery just like Irfan was uh, making sure that I could speak and be heard and my phone was functioning properly. Uh, on the machine-to-machine -machine world, moving electrons, there is really no tolerance for for what just happened in our call. <laughs> and the system would have, would have failed uh, uh, miserably. Uh, so somehow we need to really redesign our grid, redesign our, our 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 way of doing things. And so the question is, that how do we get? How do we move there? How do we go there from that single first generation model of standalone networks and standalone uh, head ends, if you will, that don't talk to each other, that don't allow for that seamless correlation through rule based control to to a world that does. And so. So the traditional model, again, is evolving. I think it's probably evolving faster where the utilities have already faced this challenge and, like Austin Energy, have realized that at the beginning it seems because you wanted to do it the cheapest way possible, you see, you want to go for the cheapest solution, and you continue to do this standalone single vendor application networks uh, doing on license frequencies, and then eventually you get in trouble uh, and you realize you cannot manage it anymore. And, and, and the question is, how do you how do you how do you evolve uh, from that? And how, how do you do it in an elegant way without basically, you know, uh, throwing away everything you already invested in? Uh, so not an easy task, uh, clearly. Um, and then you have, you know, all kinds of new market pressures going on around how, uh, you know, basically the energy companies are going to be driven to, to push for more efficiencies uh, on how they manage the grid, on how they deliver energy, and how they deliver information about the energy that is consumed. And so all of a sudden, you know, this whole push about doing a better job of managing data, you know, transactional, operational, uh, uh, it's going to become far more uh, imperative and far more important than it's ever had in the past. We, I would call our industry a, a data-rich industry, but a, but an information-poor and knowledge-poor industry. And so we have to turn a lot of this data that we have been collecting and that we're going to start collecting from all of the end devices into real information and real knowledge. And that's clearly, you know, a great opportunity for um, vendors, uh, but it's a phenomenal challenge for the industry at large. Um, and then, obviously, you know, the biggest thing about all this is how do we do this securely? You know, how do how do we secure the edge devices? How do we secure the networks? How do we secure the servers? How do we secure the transactions? For example, uh, as simple as the fact that you build a lot of security and then you let somebody on a browser that is not secure to access your data. And when they're looking at your data, somebody can be hacking the browser that is looking at the data that you spend Hundreds of millions of dollars securing, and how do we how, how do we do this? How do we how do we make this happen in a in a cost-effective way? 
So, and then obviously things are shifting on the on how we deploy things, you know. Uh, and and I I predict that uh, in, instead of having a few networks, we're going to move to having uh, lots of networks uh, of all kinds of technologies. And somehow we need to uh, learn to design networks in a better way. Um, Would you be shocked if I told you that some of the guys that have been deploying meter networks? With uh, rudimentary tools, have finally realized that they can uh, get their hands on some uh, real design tools, and they can, set, you know, enhance dramatically the delivery of that network and uh, reduce actually the operating cost of that network, and in, in many cases, being able to shrink the number of uh, base stations or routers or concentrators or whatever they're called in that network technology. Uh, devices uh, to, to in the middle of that design because, you know, one of the key things about moving forward is that these networks are, while they're supposedly managing static devices that don't move, the, the network topology changes dramatically as things evolve, devices get added, trees grow, and things uh, just happen to, to impact the sort of the propagation and the, and the elements of that network. And so, so these networks need to be retuned continuously. It's not really a set it and forget it element way of design anymore. Um, and uh, so, so I have the next three slides I have for you is, is some designs that, that would spark some uh, conversation. I I apologize for the acronyms. There, uh, it's an old habit, and I used to get paid directly proportional by the number of acronyms that I created when I was at Austin Energy. So I'm still. Uh, Attached to that habit, so B to G is building to grid, and H to grid, H to grid is home to grid, and V to G is uh, vehicle, and E S is energy storage, and D G is distributed generation. And so, this is the the utility smart grid design that that pretty much uh, I profess these days, where you have the back office integrated somehow to some service oriented architecture, uh, middleware, bus. Uh, talking to a smart grid network management system that I profess is the interface to, on top of all kinds of things that, that enable the collection and the management of the information and the devices that are throughout the infrastructure. Uh, what that looks like on the building to grid design in particular is the, the ability to design buildings that turn into, you know, basically. Uh, uh, dynamic entities on the grid that can do, that can participate with the grid on dynamic pricing and curtailment signals and load forecasts and things like that. And, and now all of a sudden you can redesign your grid to have, you know, not only a better DG on the rooftop and maybe solar thermal on the windows and electric vehicles and, and you know, energy storage and so on and thermal storage on the, on the basement. But now you can, you know, actively be producing and shutting off things and having a pretty dynamic demand response capacity by allowing the the systems of the utility to talk to the building energy management system. And, and then the question becomes, how do you do all that? And what are the mechanisms and the networks and the systems to, to make that happen? And, um, and again, a lot of handshaking going on uh, that, that makes these challenges very difficult. Um, and then the, this one is probably what most people in, that is not, that is not in the utility from the utility side itself, but you know, kind of coming at the industry. Most people are very enamored with this picture because it's you know the home and where we live, and we kind of tend to gravitate to a smart home and what it would look like, and and all the devices and the elements from solar power generation of the rooftop to some kind of micro generation, wind or natural gas, and uh, you know, outside on the on the yard, or clearly you have the smart meter there, and and perhaps you have an integrated breaker box that allows you to have all the inverters and all the things in that box. And there are some uh, companies that have, that have been trying to uh, make a breakthrough on this. Uh, and clearly, you have smart appliances and electric vehicle and a home energy management system and energy storage and fuel cell and, and all kinds of things going on in this home. And, and the question becomes again, what if this was again an active uh, element of the network that 
not only was a load, but it was also a resource, and and you could manage it, uh, at, you know, either through load control signals or through price signals, uh, in a way that you know clearly the market uh, endorsed it. You know, maybe it's up ten as it's done in Austin, uh, and not 100% mandated, but you know, clearly whatever works. Every market is unique, and in the in the world and so but somehow technologically speaking how do you enable all this how do you enable the security the different kinds of networks needed how do you make all this kind of work and how do you assure to the different uh, players uh, you know at the residential at the building uh, at the vehicle standalone in a charging station somewhere in the middle of nowhere uh, to back to the utility that these elements are you know, inter in interconnected properly and can charge or discharge properly in a way that, you know, everybody can be happy with. So, so what we need, at least short term, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a, uh, an evolution of that uh, dedicated network world where instead of having a single, uh, you know, infrastructure, which is probably what some folks would say, so some people would say, well, just, just choose my network technology and choose my gear and be done with it. And the challenge for that with that is that, you know, it's very difficult for the utility as a service provider to to choose one technology for to do anything. And, and most likely it will be impossible to do so. And you will always have multiple technologies, either multiple protocols on wireless, multiple, you know, vendors on applications and multiple vendors doing hardware for you. and. And so, you know, the notion that one company will do it all, which some could because they have elements on all these building blocks, but it's still it's just unrealistic to think that one company or at least the one utility is going to buy everything from one single vendor and be done with it. Uh, so, so you end up nevertheless having gazillion devices out there, and you still have the third-party devices that don't, you don't have control over and you need to somehow talk to and interface with. And, and so uh, my proposal is to, to evolve to having a smart grid network management system. And, and what does that mean? Uh, so let's get into that. So, so what I mean, though, is, and I'm not trying to um, diminish the notion of, of what network management system has evolved into in the IT world, but I could tell you that in a smart grid world where 17 milliseconds matter, um, that a, a summary page of what's going on with alarms and beautiful KPIs, key performance indicators, is not going to cut it. The, what you need really is a closed loop network of networks that allows multiple network infrastructures comprise you know, of the, you know, different vendors and different service providers, maybe public and private networks, that all need to perform as one as one fabric. But the key first word there to add is that it needs to be a closed loop, which means that whatever you're looking at on the screen needs to be able to have that infamous red button that allows you to turn something on and off or or do something to it that you need to do. To achieve whatever you're trying to achieve, that that um, it's got to be you know tightly integrated, tightly controlled, and it needs to be you know to use a specific software term, it needs to have two-way traceability. Uh, if you do something on that device, that I need to find out when I'm behind the screen, and if I do something behind the screen, the device needs to respond to what I said I, I was doing on the screen. Uh, a lot of systems out there are more summary monitoring systems. They're not true closed loop uh, systems. Um, so, so what does this uh, smart grid NMS does? So it, it clearly provides differentiated services, things like dynamic allocation of resources, including bandwidth optimization, resource selection and modification, centralized scheduling, which, you know, in turn allows the networks to achieve sort of this notion of greater efficiencies and throughput uh, in, 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 in throughout its service territory, sort of the concept of the best network, the best frequency, the best utilization time uh, with predictable performance and compliance, right? And and what you want is, again, this, this uh, smart grid NMS to, to have priorities 
you know, by different types of packets. So the real com real time communications are now broken out, but also avoid causing any deterioration of low latency applications and services. Again, you're you're managing a lot of things like meters that can be read whenever they can be read, and the information back and forth of those meters don't matter unless you're using that meter as the last answer for for an outage event, and then all of a sudden that communication should have the priority because it's going to go all the way to eventually to the SCADA system. One would hope to really figure out what to do with the with the system, right? So, so you know, again, the the NMA, this the smart grid network management system needs to have the so the system redundancy built in and proactively monitor the performance, utilization, and quality of service and the outages of everything that it's talking to and it's managing. Uh, so again, the notion of just doing summary, uh, just to see beautiful screens with red, green, yellow lights is kind of nice, but it's really not uh, practical for operation point of view. And the question is, how do we make this new system truly a closed loop system? So, so uh, clearly some of the key features are the traditional FCAPs, fall configuration accounting performance and security management. Uh, but further than that, you know, I would say that it's, it's, it's very important that this system has, um, you know, visualization, sophisticated visualization built in uh, that, that enables you to do a lot of, you know, sort of what if play scenarios with business logic, uh, all kinds of rules that you can push to the edge uh, as there's intelligence uh, emerging on the edge devices because they have, you know, microprocessors and memory and capacity. And, and clearly there is a lot of distributed processing to handle that. And then you, the, you are clearly, you know, doing element management. But more importantly, one of the key features that I think is fundamental is that today a lot of the, all these networks and the devices on these networks are not mapped out in the GIS. And to me that is a major flaw because, you know, now I have a crew that is trying to fix the grid or trying to do something, but then the network stuff that is managing the grid that talks to the grid and does something to it doesn't appear in my drawings and it's not part of what I'm doing. And so, you know, it's kind of like, you know, why not, you know? And so so somehow this smart grid network management system needs to be able to populate, do discovery and populate in the GIS uh, seamlessly without human intervention uh, where these devices are located in the grid and what are they doing to the devices they are interconnected with, you know. So shows just like you have sort of uh, con connection on, on the faces and, 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 the, and, the, and the grid itself on the GIS on the elements, you should be able to show the same kind of relationship, if you will, uh, of the um, network devices and to what electric devices are they talking to and, and managing. Um, Additionally, you, you, this system needs to have, you know, visualization of all those collections and provisioning uh, and, and showing you, you know, sort of the fabric so that you can see that you have potentially LTE and Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi and WiMAX and RF mesh in different parts of your network and, and should be able to show you how you could, sh you know, sort of move your information regardless of, the edge points of final delivery, but within the sort of the multi-radio infrastructure that I'm um, advocating to, where as soon as as soon as that data is collected from a edge device, it comes into the network, and now that network is a multi-radio network that is transmitting and moving data in multiple protocols, uh, and you can choose the best path for that. And then obviously you want a, a, the system to have the capabilities of you know, out of the bat, this is a U.S. standard, NERC SIP for cybersecurity and FIPS compliant, uh, again, another U.S. standard. Um, and then and then uh, a few more features here real quick. Um, clearly, you want to, to support uh, all kinds of things, and I think I went through this list already from Fiverr to Ethernet to LTE, et cetera. Uh, but more importantly, you want this system to really be policy-based control for asset management, network optimization, traffic prioritization across different communications infrastructures. Yeah, again, this whole notion of setting and forgetting it and, and doing nothing to it anymore and, and, and let the routers do the talking, uh, it's kind of complicated uh, when you're doing real-time control and you need assurance of the edge device. Uh, so somehow we need a happy in-between here 
where the main system being logically designed and managing infrastructure uh, is, is able to have closed loop control of what's going on. Uh, and, and clearly, you know, the, the biggest challenge of all this is, you know, around the protocols. And you know, when I say that, I'm talking about DMP versus multi-speak versus TCP versus UDP, that, you know, not all those protocols are created equal when it comes to the war real time. And, and you, and, you know, in this smart grid world, we, we clearly do need real time or as close as real time as 17 milliseconds can get. Um, and then, obviously, you want to offer, you know, sort of this, you know, notion of can I have the same app time in this network that I have on my electric network. Uh, and, and so the benefits are too many. Uh, but, you know, if you think about that world, you could actually turn anything into a virtual power plant on the demand side if you wanted to. And so this whole notion of uh, worrying about peak and needing to have, um, you know, um, uh, peaking plants uh, uh, for, you know, uh, solving problems around central wind generation or all kinds of things would be eliminated uh, because, you know, if the smart grid was truly deployed and if this smart grid network management system was there, then, you know, every device, uh, you could act on it, you know, to either increase the load or reduce the load uh, that is consuming uh, or producing. Uh, and so, it, and obviously you could, you know, preempt all kinds of fault detection, isolation, or restoration elements, and all kinds of load management, bar control issues, and all kinds of maintenance issues, and and it would be, you know, sort of a panacea, you know, but they, we need to build this. It's just, it's inevitable that we need to do it. Um, uh, more benefits uh, around the notion that, you know, you would want this to be uh, a system that allows you to grow with time, that, again, one of the challenges that we have in the utility world is that we don't want to throw away what we have built. Uh, so um, we need to find a way to kind of coexist and bring some of the systems uh, in a nested way as nested networks and control with the closed loops. Um, and then you you have to again uh have the ability to 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 work with multiple standards and multiple vendors uh in their infrastructure and and be able to choose from the best of breed that is available to you and then you you need to uh be able to improve the capabilities of leveraging uh backup uh capacity and and be able to add you know new capacity sort of on the fly by if you have a total private network by adding public uh, access to it when you need to because you had an outage or some sort or something like that. So wouldn't it be nice if somehow you had a system that would allow you to kind of replicate its closed loop control from private network to public network to both in, in a very few minutes uh, as you're shifting from one kind of infrastructure to another to overcome, you know, a significant outage or something that has occurred. Uh, and then you want a system that is, you know, reduces your 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 cost, uh, you know, the human element cost of managing this thing and dealing with it and troubleshooting and and then clearly the the the, the financial cost. So in the end, what we're trying to do is is really boom, here it is. Here's a smart grid, soups to nuts, all the protocols, all the pieces of things talking from central windmills to everything in between. And this is how you do it, and wow, it's a piece of cake, and, you know, it's all work in tomorrow morning. Uh, obviously, this is not as easy as uh, it's written in words, and it's a journey. But clearly, that journey, you know, as, as I take an example of our product, AirSync, uh, which is, uh, I, you know, uh, clearly, no surprise, uh, the smart grid network management system of my choice, uh, is, uh, you know, that enables to basically put the software where you need it, deploy it to the elements that you need to on the different networks and different devices from any vendor, and then you, you know, can have closed loop control of your existing infrastructure that you already bought. And as you move forward, you can, you know, design and architect your infrastructure to look slightly different from what you did before. And this last rendition just gives you an idea that, again, you know, no one size fits all and not everything should be done in one, overnight. But, you know, clearly this architecture where you have, you know, 
and software on the edge devices and in the middle of the infrastructure and in the back office that is interrelated in and in, in with a closed loop control over the you know creating a virtual control plane on the network fabric that you can manage your AMI and your transmission automation, substation automation, distribution automation, and your microgrid stuff that's being deployed or will be deployed in your infrastructure by third-party companies. And then, you know, clearly your demand response and anything around DER, distributed energy resources, so solar panels, again, DG, uh, or electric vehicles or energy storage of some sort. And with that, you know, I am kind of eager to see if there are some questions, Irfan, and maybe we can go back to some slides to help uh, go deeper on some elements. Hello? Yes, uh, you're still there. Yeah, okay. good. Very good. All right, so uh, let's um, have people put some of the questions uh, from his presentation, from Andre's presentation, and we're going to go into a Q&A uh, session. I'm going to move the presenter ball back to myself. All right, and I am also, while you're posting your questions, I'm going to share another event uh, that is coming up uh, very soon. We'll bring that up while people pose some questions. So there is a town hall meeting of the National Electric Sector Cybersecurity Organization. It's May 30th and 31st. It's in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. So if you want more information, there's a website on this slide uh, that uh, you can go to and you can register for this. It gives a very nice uh, Q&A format. So uh, uh, let's, uh, let me put this slide here for a minute and uh, see if there's some questions. Okay, so I do see some, a question from Bert Taub who is asking, where have smart grid network management systems been deployed so far in general example, Austin Power? And where has AirSync been implemented in particular? Thank you for your explanations. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so I would say that the smart grid network management system journey is uh, somewhat new. Uh, Sempra Energy is a customer of ours and they are building their smart grid using uh, AirSync. Uh, they have a very hybrid infrastructure with uh, fiber and they use public carrier and they use ITRON for their meters and their mesh. And, uh, and they're just a classic example of a, of a company that is building a lot of infrastructure. Uh, our software, historically, uh, the company has been around since 2005, has been deployed quite a bit in India on the telco side. We sell our software to private uh, network carriers, and we also sell it in the transportation sector to airlines. So we have about 200 customers worldwide, uh, somewhat new to the energy space. I've been doing energy only for about a year and a half. Um, Cisco licensed the software uh, in a partnership with us a while back. And um, uh, CSC has licensed the software uh, to build a service in the cloud. And again, uh, Sempra Energy is sort of our uh, uh, premier um, account that has licensed our software on the energy space. Okay. We have a question. Oh, we have a, a few questions now coming up. Uh, and by the way, when I say Sempra Energy, for those that don't, and maybe don't connect the dots on every, all the details, Sempra Energy is a holding company that owns San Diego Gas and Electric and SoCal uh, Gas. Right. Now, for those of you who joined a little later, this was another event that I had announced, which was the West 2012 Summit by Sustainable Silicon Valley. 
So uh, I'll leave this slide on as I look at some of the other questions that are being posted for Andres. So here is a question from Alan Gartner, who asks, Andres, what do you consider the major unmet need in the communications from utility to substation and also utility to customer? Uh, the main unmet need from, uh, from utility to substation. Um, okay. I would say I would say the the, the needs on the on the auto, uh, communication uh, from central generation to the substation are all met, so there are nothing missing there. Uh, one of the challenges that is going on that the utility needs to deal with, and we need to figure out how to manage this, is um, clearly there's a desire to create a common backplane, and so a lot of people have been professing IP, which I'm one of them around uh, making all this uh, communication infrastructure come back and be homogenized. Uh, and within the substation, you know, IP only talks to sort of part of the substation, uh, and the rest is not on IP. Uh, the protection equipment is still a challenge for IP. Uh, and one of the interesting things that will happen as uh, we try to manage meters and distribution infrastructure downstream from the substation, is that as we add DG and energy storage to the grid and electric vehicles, we will be challenged with putting uh, protection equipment downstream besides the substation, which we have never done before, uh, significantly in volume. And the question is how do we go about doing that in a way that, you know, uh, sort of, you know, doesn't complicate the world that we're in, but unfortunately it is going to complicate. So I think that, you know, somehow the architecture of a substation needs to be replicated uh, in advance and pushed out to the edge of the grid because the Volvar challenges of DAS, DG, electric vehicle things, energy storage things are going to really make that grid look really funky. As, again, think about the, the example that I was sharing with Austin Energy. 3,000 megawatts central load, 5,000 megawatts on the edge. Now all needs to be in harmony. How do you do that? Right. And then, uh, and then, and then his question on the, on, I would say that the, the key thing on the edge, on the, from the, from the customer point of view to, is that you know, there there's still maybe too many standards, and um, and there is a there is a lack of interoperability. And what what the, the way to solve interoperability on communications is just to go just to go for for multi radio things. So multi radio endpoints, multi radio infrastructure, and if you do that, you can still maintain the proprietary nature of the standards and the topologies but you have a fail-safe. So that's probably one of the things that will continue to emerge is, you know, maybe software-defined radio becomes a reality uh, for edge devices here uh, shortly in, a, in an affordable way. But somehow we need, you know, multi-radio uh, fabric. The next question is from Dale Gutierrez who says, what economic scale do you think the smart grid industry will reach in the near future? Hmm. Well, that's a, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> that's a tough one. My uh, response is that there's definitely the Gartner hype cycle in all things. Uh, so yeah. in the issue, whatever numbers we come up with, it's always safe to say it'll be in the billions and then it turns out to be in the high hundreds of millions. Yeah, and, uh, I, I mean, there are so many ways of doing this. I, mean, I can tell you for a fact that between 2003 and 2010, we didn't raise rates for customers at Austin Energy. Now, I'm not saying to everybody who is listening to this call that that is the way to do it for everybody that is listening to this call. And and But, but you know, take, for example, Volvar, savings if you are really going to tighten up your infrastructure and bulb our control management. So so say you're losing 10% uh, 
on Volvar. Uh, and so what is 10% of the annual revenues? And if you eliminated that Volvar, you know, 10%, would that be, would that be, um, would that be, uh, you know, a benefit to you? Obviously, if you're not, if you're a retailer now, but if you are an integrated utility and you're saving, um, on, you know, having to build a new power plant, uh, and you have a way of, uh, getting paid for performance as an electric utility, not just for kilowatt hours, then, you know, maybe, maybe there's a, little, a lot of money to be made, right? Because, you know, the, the grid could deliver a smart, a t t tightly integrated, close loop control, smart grid end to end, could improve generation, transmission, substation, distribution, metering, and demand response efficiencies to the tune of 30, 40% of the business in terms of benefits, real revenues, new, pro, new, new, new revenues, elimination of theft. I mean, there's all kinds of things that a true smart grid enables, you know, uh, just turning, you know, creating demand through building, being, to, being able to have a dynamic virtual power plant and turning that into capacity and, Embedding that on the on the wholesale market, which is now allowed by two of the ISO RTOs in the United States, that's you know that could be huge. That you know, could be you know a lot of money. So so clearly the smart grid needs to happen because you know if you don't do it where you're at, and the next guy next to you does it, then the sort of the, the smart grid divide phenomena will start impacting you. So one of the reasons, financial reasons, uh, Austin Energy benefited dramatically from all this infrastructure and automation in Austin uh, was that we attracted a lot of, you know, commercial and industrial customers to our territory because we had great service, you know, great quality of service, you know, great restoration, great uptime, great price. You know, beyond the fact that you know it's it's a, it's a great place to be, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, there are questions coming up uh, on the chat, so I'm going to ask uh, some of those questions. Uh, mm -hmm. One question from Sarah Bavarian, who asks: With some traditional network management software, the challenge is to develop new models for each and every new device on the network, does AirSync have an advantage in that regard? Yeah, yeah. what you need to think about is that the, the architecture of the future is not a polling architecture with a central control head that needs to pull everything in order to make a decision. That what you want to do is you want to do a, the reverse of that. You want to push intelligence to the edge, and you want to manage by exception at all levels. And what you want to do is you want to do a nested network design, and you want to do correlation at the right levels of the the, the 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 sort of the network. So, you know, distribution feeders should be talking to each other, uh, meters should be talking to each other, cap banks should be talking to each other, things like that. And so, so all of a sudden, this whole notion of a round trip and the, the challenges of a round trip for the physics of the time management and the real time need and the decision making that that intelligence could be pushed out to the edge to the edge to the edge and the farther you push it out the better for the architecture no different than you know the human body and the nervous system and how we have all this self protection mechanisms when you know our body you know or say our hand is next to a stove and feeding without looking at the stove it is hot and you feel it with your finger, you move your hand by itself. And so clearly that's, a, you know, the whole thalamus, hypothalamus uh, scenario there. But, but you know, that, that's the kind of intelligence that you want to build in your system. You, we we got to move away from three guys looking at a screen, making all the decisions of the grid. They, they won't be able to keep up. Nothing wrong with the three guys. The three guys are fantastic. But they're not going to be able to keep up with the 10 million alarms. Very good. Uh, uh, on the question of economic scale, it also depends on where you draw the boundary uh, when you're assessing a market because the uh, devices on the grid are becoming intelligent gradually. They're becoming more and more networked. So that's just an evolutionary process. 
And so mm-hmm. the initiation line between what is considered smart grid and what's not is getting blurred. I always like to distinguish between the two by saying that, look, if something can happen passively without requiring a digital network, in other words, you're just using Kirchhoff's law and Ohm's law intelligently, then mm-hmm. that's traditional grid. But yep. the moment you start taking information of physical phenomena, converting it into digital information from which a decision is being made about how to alter the design in real time, then that's smart grid. Whether it's a smart meter, whether it's a sensor on the distribution network, or a phase of measurement unit, it doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Pat Duggan, uh, who was previously with Con Ed, asks, uh, how much of a challenge uh, will it be to accommodate the higher priority bus burst of data, changes of state, relay targets, oscillography, system data during a major multi-zone trip out? No, n- n- there, there will be no difficulty. Again, the difficult the difficulty you have today is that you probably live in a paradigm when you're relying on existing networks to have a set it forget it network management system that is not in tune with the rules and with your service level agreement delivery needs. So if you put AirSync on the agent devices you're trying to manage throughout the infrastructure that you're delivering that assurance back into the server central control room, now you have a closed loop quality of service management system that will do exactly as you need on the infrastructure that you need when you need to. And that's a paradigm shift that needs to occur. Um, we, we, tend to, we tend to marry our system solution approach to the capabilities of the standalone infrastructure elements that we acquire, and we surrender to the lowest common denominator service level agreement capabilities that they have. And because those systems have never been designed to manage an electric grid, they're really not adequate. Very good. Next question from Jim Hayes about getting a slide of uh, the copy of the slides. Everyone who registered for this and the entire distribution is going to get a PDF version of this presentation. So uh, look out for that. And then we have some more questions in the Q&A. Uh, next is a question by Brian Jones, who asks, could you describe the integration work you have done with Cisco and how this scales to corporate data devices, LAN, WAN, switches, routers, firewalls, etc.? Does the product support UPS monitoring? Yeah, the, the answer is that the, the relationship with Cisco is around, two pro, the, the, is around their smart grid r- r- fifth field area network router products is not uh, around all their products. So um, I think that, you know, this is probably more of you asking Cisco, I'm kind of interested in this product. What about having this product, this technology available to the rest of the infrastructure you make? Okay. Raad Al-Nuemi from United Arab Emirates asks, any work on W3C, WebSocket Specification Implementation. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And James Zahudanis of Oracle asks, Andres, can your application communicate and manage the various smart devices that make up the many energy management systems for commercial building businesses? Yeah, you can put you can put the AirSync um, client software on any target de- de- device that you want to. Uh, the product runs today on some 30 uh, platforms, and you know from embedded Linux to VxWorks to embedded Windows to all kinds of operating systems. So it supports all the, all the chipsets available to just about all the major uh, protocol technologies for communication out there. So, you know, I'm sure that it would be it wouldn't be hard to, you know, download it into your existing target choices. Okay. And then Dale Gutierrez uh, points out that the market size may be as much as sixty five billion dollars. For for a smart grid network management system? 
for the economic model that he was he was referring to that scale in the previous question of how big that market can be for smart grid. Well, you know, I mean, again, if you take if you take all the electric things that attach to the grid and the ones that are coming, but all the things, sockets, everything, plugs in the wall, if you take all the water, if you take all the gas devices out there, it's roughly 10 billion things. Yes. It's it's huge, right? So so let me um, ask you a couple of questions as we wind up this uh, webinar. I wanted to give the audience an opportunity, and you've done a very good job asking a variety of questions. But let's uh, go a little further into an assertion you made about uh, the uh, environment being data rich but information poor. And mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about Okay, so we develop these uh, standards, we have objects, uh, we can take uh, the attributes of devices with different levels of granularity, hold mm -hmm. them with different frequencies. So how do we determine the balancing point between one side where there is too much data and not enough information and the other side where there's too little data from which very little information can be derived. How do you create that balance between the two extremes? Well, I mean, the, the, the thing about it is that the, the biggest missing thing, I mean, the, the, the devices are already, if they're not collecting data because they don't have a database, the devices are in the midst of a, of a universe of, of of data that is flowing through them, right? These devices just don't have the telemetry built in, and they don't have the communication built in, right? So, so somehow we need to find an inexpensive way of adding, you know, a database, a bit of a a bit of memory, a bit of processing capacity and communication to everything that we make. Uh, and deploy it so that we can, you know, monitor it and control it and manage it. And so um, it's clearly a journey, but it's already happening. I mean, uh, a Wi-Fi chip costs a dollar. Uh, I mean, this the, the price, the Moore's law is just phenomenally going in such a frenzy that you know it's just you know ten years from now that Wi-Fi chip will probably cost a penny. So how can you build new products without, you know, uh, putting in intelligence in them? And then why would you have to throw away existing infrastructure? Well, all you have to do is get some kind of thumb drive looking thing that has a radio in it and enough memory and processing capacity to plug into a serial port or Ethernet port and, you know, connect to something. So I, I think that, you know, we are already collecting a lot of information. I think that the current, you know, Austin Energy went from roughly 20 terabytes of total information in the company to about 100 terabytes when I left, and it was forecasted or planned that by the time the meters were being read about every five minutes, uh, it would be doing 400 terabytes of, of total uh, new data. I mean, these are yearly numbers. And uh, and if we wanted to move to real time control of everything in the grid in Austin, that that would become basically 1.2 petabytes. And and so the United States numbers, if all the elements in the grid were to be managed real time, which they should, in my opinion, if you wanted to have great quality of service and great restoration times and outage management information. Um, then, you know, the, the number in the U.S. is roughly uh, uh, 2,000 petabytes of information on a yearly basis just generated by the grid. Um, it, this is all within our scope. I mean, we, we can handle this. We can manage this. Uh, I think the key here is, is um, you know, I don't want to – I don't want to sound uh, in any way, shape, or form like I'm saying, look – um, stop and wait for perfection. No, you know, you know, as a good engineer, you know, I would argue to, to say to you, as I've 
told most of my teams over the years that I worked with that perfection is the enemy of good. Uh, you gotta, you gotta deploy something. You gotta learn. You gotta, you gotta start monitoring things. You gotta start managing what you're doing. The key thing is I'm making you, I'm forcing you to think differently because perhaps you haven't been at the end of the rainbow like I have and realized that there was not a pot of gold, but actually, you know, a much bigger mountain to climb after, after all that journey. And, uh, and there's got to be a different way of doing this, and you've got to be asking the right questions to your partners, to your vendors, to your providers, so that you don't have to be making these choices about too much and too little. I mean, things don't need to cost that much. Technology keeps going cheaper and cheaper in price every 18 to 24 months in a significant way. Uh we got to be able to automate the entire grid. We have to do it. It has to be done, and, and it shouldn't cost an arm and a leg. Yeah. So a couple of things that uh, seem to be coming out of the evolution of electronics and uh, communication technology, uh, one is that uh, there will definitely be a greater need for distributed intelligence and distributed computing capability, and Moore's Law is helping us do that, and mm -hmm. we should resist the tendency to take everything back to some kind of centralized repository for processing, because not only uh, does that create bottlenecks, but it can also cause problems if the wide area network, for instance, is out or, or other disruptions occur. So what are your thoughts about distributed intelligence and distributed computing as good uh, values to pursue uh, for network management of smart grid. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the basis of the design of uh, AirSync. It's uh, totally distributed. Uh, we have a, a module called the Distributed Resource Manager, which is basically you know, a, a software logic that can be put anywhere um, downstream in the infrastructure from away from the central point of the server to, to enable basically this notion of nested networks. Uh, you you want to push the intelligence to the very edge of the network. Uh, you don't you you don't want to have a, a design that basically uh, limits your ability to make decisions because you are handicapped from day one on a 17 millisecond inevitability, but you have an infrastructure in a physical distance that kills that parameter. And so somehow you need to build this notion of nested networks. And and so the devices are already there. All they need to do is they need to become intelligent, capable devices to build the nested networks. I mean, you got meters behind transformers. You got transformers behind feeders. You got cap banks and behind, you know, feeders behind cap banks. and you know, substations, you know, cap banks behind substations and so on and so on and so on. And and somehow you want to build, you know, redundancy and minus one and minus two. I mean, think about the example of building intelligence to solve the problem of protection equipment and the distribution grid on my neighborhood. Uh, is, is the utility going to put... Uh, you know, protection equipment all the way to the transformer in the house because me and the three other neighbors underneath this transformer all bought electric vehicles, and now we have nine electric vehicles and three car garages each with, the say, two kilo, kilo, kilowatt hour batteries each, which if we all plug in and everybody's at home, we mail the transformer outside the house. So... So what do they need to do? Well, they need to put a box, maybe with energy storage and distributed intelligence, next to that transformer, uh, so the storage would, you know, be able to somehow deal with bulk the volt bar difference and have the intelligence and be able to talk to the feeder upstream and to the substation at the most and be able to find a way to balance its load, and so that we don't melt the transformer. And so. So all of a sudden, you know, we, we, we really need to get serious about writing better software, better algorithms to manage power versus relying on three guys to move switches and burn more, you know, more fuel to boil more water to spin another turbine.
Very good. So as you can see, uh, for those of you who are on the call, who've uh, listened to Andres uh, speaking for the better part of the last hour and 15 minutes, talking about a very critical element in the deployment of Smart Grid, which is to develop this network management layer in order, as you saw some of the benefits from it, uh, when it comes to these costs, like the training costs and the cost of ownership, this is going to be critical in how widely smart grid technology gets deployed. It's usually these types of things that uh, limit or hinder deployment of certain technologies. And so having a well-thought-out strategy uh, on paper first and then putting it out incrementally as your budget allows you is going to be so important in Smart Grid. So I really want to thank you, Andres, for uh, making our audience more aware of the need for a Smart Grid network management system, answering their questions, and also emphasizing some of the best practices that are needed in our sector. So thank you. If you have any final comments, Andres? No, I, I appreciate the opportunity there, Fun. I, I love what you're doing with uh, the series here on education. And uh, I love the notion that this is an incredibly global audience. And uh, so you all know how to reach me now, and uh, I look forward to our continued dialogue. All right. Thank you again, Andres Carvalho. And thank you to all our audience. At this time, I will end uh, the recording. And uh, 